Hello. The Kim and Kevin show. It's the best show. So fun fact, I went off of social media for two months. Right. So a little over eight weeks and I read seven books. Wow. Wow. It tells you how much time I waste on like, social media. Like the actual books? Like actual books reading it. Yes. Wow. I, yeah. And annotating and taking notes and journaling. And it's been wonderful. I've got several books that I've gone a few chapters in, but I just, I can never finish one. But if I do it audiobook and I can do other stuff, like I can be watching the dishes and listening to the audiobook, it's like I can finish a book, no problem. Yes, <laughs> multitasking. Exactly. <laughs> so today, you've everybody's noticed Carol is not here. She is off to Orlando, I believe, Florida. I think so. I think that's right. Yeah, Orlando. To be doing all the things that she does, talking about FSM with the Time Waiver Group, I believe. Yeah. Great. So everybody's stuck with me this week. And um, what I've prepared is a little synopsis, if you will, of what we do with the sports course. But instead of just talking about what we do with the sports course, I put together, because I love doing PowerPoints, a few slides that talk about FSM in action. And that'll give you a little rundown of how we do things with the sports course. Okay, so yeah, today it's going to be a little shorter and sweeter. Like I said, I just want to share a few case studies that show FSM in action and kind of talk about how we walk through things from my perspective and maybe give some people a different lens in which to look at some injuries and we'll go from there. So I believe I can share my screen, right? As a host, it looks like I have share screen. You have disabled screen sharing. There we go. It should be back on. Yeah, it makes me click this other thing. Yes, there it is. Perfect. I'm going to share this little PowerPoint. I'm going to hit share. I'm going to do a slideshow from this current slide. I hope I'm not the only one that talks to themselves as much as I do, but hopefully everybody can see the subacute injury, emotional frequencies, hematoma, nerve damage, torsion up on their screen. So yeah, we're going in the sports course, instead of, we do things a little bit backwards then from what we do at the core. In the core, we talk about chronic injuries, stages of healing, and then we finish off with the acute stuff. Um, and in the sports course, we start with all the acute injuries, and then we work our way through subacute and then into chronic. So this subacute injury was actually pretty acute. It was only about four days old when I got my hands on this person. And I thought this would be a good one to start with because it talks about all the things that I didn't think worked. And this was my, this was a big catalyst, this big case for me where I learned how to use the emotional frequencies that I talk about very often. So getting right into things. So the history of this player, he had a really big bruise, what we call crush injury, where the soft tissue was smushed and smashed. It blew up, it bled. He had two really big bruises. He had two really big falls in one game in a short time period. So when I got to see him, we noticed his left glute was really inflamed. We saw a really big bruise, a big hematoma. We saw a lot of splinting and splinting is a word we use for when the associated or neighboring musculature has an opinion about the injury and decides to tighten up, splint or protect the area. So we saw glute medius, glute maximus and piriformis all in this super hypertonic state. Gait is obviously compromised in ability to sit down. When we're looking at range of motion, coxa internal rotation or hip internal rotation was restricted about 80%. So he had very little internal rotation. Coxa flexion or hip flexion was limited about 70% on the left when compared bilaterally. And what the diagnosis was from the doctor that he saw was this would be at least a four week rest injuries. They wouldn't be able to do anything except for rest it for four weeks. And after about four days of being super frustrated, another player said, you've got to see Kim and try some FSM and I bet you it'll work. And not for a spoiler alert, but it did obviously. So I'll just walk you through this portion. First treatment, I am running 40 and 396, quiet the activity of the nerve for about five minutes. 
and his pain decreased by half. So I know this is always one of the biggest questions is, where do I start? And I always say, regardless of the patient, regardless of the condition, if somebody walks in with a lot of pain, public enemy number one, your first thing that you should be doing, regardless of taking your history and trying to figure out where it started, is get the pain down. And a lot of times, like running 4396, 40 and 10, those are big slam dunks in taking pain down. So a lot of times, even if you're stuck on where to start, I'll start with 4396, quiet the activity of that nerve. And with an acute or subacute injury, we know there's a ton of inflammation around the area. So that's a really safe place to start. 4396, after about five minutes, he's, oh, that feels amazing. The pain is going down. Great. So now I can get into some of the, what do my kids always say? Okay, Captain Obvious. So the obvious things are bleeding and things are torn. So 40, 18, 124 in your A, 62, the muscle belly or the vessels, 77, the connective tissue, 97 is adipose. And I want to talk about that one in a second. 142, the fashion, 396, the nerve. 97, in my opinion, is overlooked a ton. There is adipose everywhere. And especially when you're dealing with the glute, there's a lot of adipose on the glute. I don't care how lean you are, there's going to be adipose in that area. And there's there's adipose intertwined with the hamstrings, with the sciatic nerve. So when you look at the anatomy of the area that you're looking at, don't forget the adipose. Like it legitimately is everywhere. And it also gets torn. When vessels bleed, they bleed onto it. So when we were talking a little while ago, a little while ago about 18, we don't just pair 18 with vessels because when something bleeds, it doesn't just contain itself in the vessel, right? Like it bleeds onto something. So that's why we'll run bleeding in the periosteum or bleeding in the connective tissue or bleeding in the adipose because when there's trauma, it, th those vessels kind of leak in there. So the first stage of those protocols were just like that cleanup crew, taking out the inflammation, the bleeding, the torn and broken, those really obvious ones with those B channels. And when I treat patients, I'm always hands-on and I like to always move my patients. So in this case, this patient would have been prone on the table with his knee flexed to 90, my hands on his sacrum by this by his glute. And I'm just doing internal, really gentle internal and external hip rotation, just rocking that hip so I can see what that tissue looks like. When you have an acute or subacute injury, you don't want to be grabbing onto the tissue in a lot of the cases, right? It's acute, it's flared. It's traumatized. So in this case, I can just put one hand on a sacrum and lumbosacral complex and one hand just doing internal and external rotation of his hip. And you can see when things start to move better, right? Like you can see the tissue, you can see that his whole body isn't going to be rocking in this splinting area. Things start to let go and you can see things start to move independently. I, so this was years ago that I did this treatment and just intuitively I let 124 run for 20 minutes. And I believe this was the winter before the advanced that Carol made the announcement that 124 is definitely time dependent. So it was just neat because a lot of times people are like, how long are you running these frequencies for? And we'll say, oh, a minute or two or until you get smush. But it just seemed like in such an acute slash subacute setting that we needed to run 124 for a long time. And I actually ran 18 for quite a long time, too, because you could just see the tissue. It was almost like a balloon starting to deflate. You could just see the tissue starting to go down. It was really cool. And. Just doing that really gentle passive range of motion, internal and external rotation, I was already seeing an improvement. So internal rotation was improving at least by 30% just by that first 20, 25 minutes. Flexion improved by 20% when we retested. And then I ran the concussion protocol because you just have to run it. So that's two separate machines at that time, custom care running concussion protocol, patient falls asleep. 
And then I had my precision care and I was doing the other stuff. So a little bit of controversy with these next set of frequencies, perhaps, is running 81. So increasing the secretions. Why would you increase the secretions when you were trying to take out inflammation? So again, this was intuitively when you are dealing with tissue that is inflamed and is splinting, what you want to do is increase glide, right? In between the structures, especially the adipose, the fascia, and in the glute complex, when you have so much layering going on, it seemed like a okay thing to try. And it definitely did work. So for about a minute or minute to three minutes, 81 and 49, increasing secretions and increasing the vitality to those muscle bellies, to the fascia and to the adipose and with no adverse reactions whatsoever. So don't be afraid to use 81 and 49 sometimes in those acute settings, as long as you're hands-on, as long as you're monitoring and testing and making sure pain continues to go down and range of motion continues to improve. So after that first treatment, we sent the patient home with a custom care with the standard concussion protocol on there, soft tissue acute on there. And then I customized something for torn and broken and bleeding to the vessels, connective tissue and fascia for him to use at home. You can see here pain pre-treatment when he walked in the door and going down considerably by half when he's leaving. So that's always great to monitor pre and post pain scores. So the next treatment was the very next day. And the big thing I want to start with is that all those range of motion gains that we had during that last treatment are preserved. So internal rotation and flexion are still limited by about 40%, but all the gains that we made are the same. And I think that's a really big thing to talk about because there's so many times we'll treat a patient and let's just say you are working with the shoulder and you're increasing shoulder abduction. And say you had a patient that had shoulder abduction to 45 degrees. And when you were done, they were back up to 90. You're like, wow, that's a great success. But if they come in the next day for another treatment and they're back down to 40, then you're starting all over from scratch again. So what really got me interested in FSM were these like long lasting changes that we seem to be getting. The changes that we made clinically were staying with that patient until the next time that they came in. So the next day, we're still seeing all those range of motion gains preserved. The pain is also preserved. So again, you're not starting from scratch. It's we, we came in with a nine or a 10 out of out of nine out of 10 the previous day. And if they come back in, their pain is still up again. I just view that last treatment as a party trick. We want those gains to remain with the patient. We want them to remain pain-free or have their pain decreased throughout the night into the next day so that you have a much better starting point where I started questioning where those gains might have been preserved. And I think it's because I had a custom care to give him at home. So he was running things at home to help that what I call that's that recovery process. So he's in the clinic getting treatment. And then what is he doing from the time he leaves the clinic on Wednesday to Thursday morning when he comes in? All that time, you could potentially be undoing the treatment. But if you have a tool to give your patient to complement what you did clinically, rent them or give them a custom care, it really helps your starting point for the next treatment because all of his pain was down and his range of motion was up. And that's exactly where you want to be starting from. So that next treatment, we are, again, Captain Obvious, starting with what I know worked. I know 40 worked, 18, 120 for inflammation, bleeding, and torn and broken in those connective tissue areas. But I'm also going to do trauma, the basics, right? Paralysis, the allergy reaction. I'm going to incorporate those a lot more too. Running them, I believe it was about two minutes each. I'm still doing passive range of motion to internal and external rotation of the hip. I want to test everything 
as well as talking to the patient about making sure their pain is down at the same time. So we get a little bit more internal rotation gains, 20% improvement. We get about 10% improvement for flexion after 20 minutes. Fantastic. Still going to go in there and try 81 and 49, increasing the secretions and vitality to those structures. And the patient reports that he's able to sit and drive. He's going to continue to use the custom care overnight. I'm going to run some more general, I'm going to give him general inflammation, standard concussion. He had the protocol for myofascial trigger points because he was treating his shoulder. And I'll talk about that in a minute because that one does have some of the scarring that an acute injury we typically don't want to run, but he had a shoulder injury. He wanted to try it on and we gave him the DOMS protocol because if you look at the DOMS protocol, so delayed onset muscle sore in the mode bank. And like I said, this was years ago before I was writing all the awesome programs that I write now, but the DOMS protocol is a lot like soft tissue acute, right? It's taking down the torn and broken, the bleeding and the inflammation and all those structures. So that those were the programs on the custom care that he had. And Patients won't talk to you in degrees, right, of range of motion, unless you're seeing another physical medicine person where they come in and say, my hip is restricted to 82% on the left. No one says that. They're going to give you an ADL or an activity of daily living. I can't put on my coat. I can't uh, put on my seatbelt. I have a hard time stepping into the car. So his marker was, I can't put on my shoes and I can't put on my skate. So biomechanically, I'm breaking that down. What is that motion? That's hip flexion. It's actually external rotation of his hip. Internal rotation is not something that we naturally do a ton of, but he said he's not able to do this. And this is what frustrates him. So again, pre and post pain scores, pain's going way down. One out of 10 for a professional athlete, that's like easily doable right? You can go on through, that's probably what they're continuously playing with. So the next treatment patient is pain-free in all ranges and activities. So that bruise that we're seeing continues to improve in color and size. So the inflammation is still going down. Starting frequencies, same thing, 40, 18, 124, 294, 321, 9. Inflammation, bleeding, torn and broken, trauma paralysis, allergy reaction, all those soft tissue areas, the muscle belly, connective tissue, adipose fascia, and nerve. Continuing to do passive range of motion and internal and external rotation. Look at that. Internal rotation is symmetrical. That's, that is equal now. Flexion improved by another 20%. And increasing the secretions and the vitality to those structures is actually improving with passive range of motion and it feels good. So why it could be controversial to run increasing the secretions to an area where you are decreasing the inflammation. I believe somehow FSM just does what it's supposed to. And yes, there are parameters, but as long as you are backing up your hypothesis with an objective measure, like range of motion, um, I don't see any trouble with it, especially when your intent is to improve glide between structures and you're using it for a small amount of time. So patients able to sit now on a hard surface, right? Going back to those ADLs, like how does it feel on a smushy chair versus on a harder surface, right? Like when the tissue is compressed and there's compression in the lumbar spine, does that change? So patients able to sit on the hard surface, is skating, is going on the ice. He, need, he needs somebody to put his skates on, which is doesn't go over very well when you have to ask somebody to tie your skates up for you, where he's still using the custom care at night. And this is where um, it all started to change for me. So the patient has demonstrated emotional frustration and fear. Why? Because he's not playing and the team is winning without him. And he is afraid of losing his spot. And when your patients are telling you these stories, and I believe with FSM, you develop this relationship probably a lot faster than you would normally, right? FSM can be a truth serum. People get floaty. They talk a little bit more easily with you. And so when you have a patient 
that is being vulnerable and is talking about their feelings, don't dismiss that because I used to. I said, like, oh, it's too bad. I feel sorry for you too. No, they're giving you very key phrases that you can use. And so I was getting frustrated because I was trying to get those last little pieces together. And when I finally was listening and I heard fear and I heard frustration and I heard anger, I'm like, we have frequencies for that. So I started running the frequencies for that. I used the 970s. Um, and I don't always remember what, what the frequencies are on the emotional side because I always have my laminate open. But fear, anger, rumination, frustration, all of those frequencies, I'm sure are there two minutes each. And I didn't tell the patient I was running these emotional frequencies, but because we already had a few days of mileage together treating, he knew he was very in tune with what changes were occurring. And he's like, oh, that feels so good. What do you, whatever you're running right now, I think it's really helping. I'm like, goodness. Okay. So I'm glad that feels good. And then I'm retesting hip flexion. This point patient is supine. So I'm taking up knee or hip flexion and it just starts to go. And I'm running the emotional frequencies going, you've got to be kidding me. They actually work. And I'm objectively measuring an emotional frequency. So don't discount that part either. Just because it's an emotional frequency doesn't mean it's not going to have an objective carryover to what you're treating. So he gets up off the table, feels amazing. And he's look, I could put my shoe on. Great. That means you can tie up your skate. So life is good. So pain is down. Pain is gone. Everybody's happy. Next treatment. Again, all those gains are preserved. Patient is completely pain-free. We have total symmetry, mechanically, objective measures. And we're just trying to do maintenance at this point, right? We're not just going to let them go. We want to make sure everything has been holding. So doing the same thing that we did before, we're incorporating those emotional frequencies one more time. And he's back after five, six days, as opposed to four weeks. And again, when you're dealing with return to play measures, a lot of times they'll say, this athlete can come in, but we only want them to play half their shifts, or we're going to pull them out in a second because we don't want them to play fatigued. I think it's important when people are going back to work, going back to activities, that you're asking them, how did it feel? Did you play the whole game? Did you walk the whole time you wanted to? What limited you? First game back, everything is normal performance, right? There is no need for shortened shifts. There was no need for anything because the performance was there and it was effective. So that's fantastic about that. If anybody has any questions about that particular case, you can fire it in the chat right now, or you could wait to the end. I'll just give you a couple minutes. No. Okay. This is one of my favorite ones. This is, so just going back again to what we talk about in the sports course. Yes, it's sports, but a lot of times we're just talking about injuries, right? How to treat an injury as quickly as possible, giving you the practitioner tools, how to measure your effectiveness using FSM, because let's face it, if you're referring to a doctor or another physician or another practitioner, you're not going to write, oh, I got this like smush and the patient was totally dwarfed. You can talk about that afterwards, but you need to say, after I ran certain frequencies, we improved range of motion by X, Y, Z. After the treatment that we did, pain went from nine out of 10 to two out of 10. These are measures that show your treatment was a success. And this is how you report your findings and you write up case studies and you eventually get published for this stuff. That last case dealing with a lot of the acute injury components is a little nugget of what we do with the sports course and how to use the custom care at night or in a take-home setting as well to help complement what you're doing clinically. Post-concussion syndrome Again, this can be very tricky. We have a whole component in the sports course that we talk about concussion, but we're just going to go through this one super quick. This is a patient, so this is not a not an acute concussion, but this is somebody who had their concussion three years ago and is still struggling with all the symptoms that they have. 
Concussion symptoms that you're typically going to see are migraines or headaches, depression, lack of motivation, especially in sports settings. You'll hear reports of insomnia, right? Can't sleep. So they're super tired during the day, depressed, can't motivate. But then when it's time to go to bed, they're like, let's play volleyball. They just can't sleep and their brain doesn't shut down. With athletes, typically you will see this lingering of post-exertional distress or post-exertional fatigue. In this case, he had post-exertional dizziness. So he would feel good for a couple of days, try to go back to training and boom, get dizzy after he trained. So then he'd have to take more time off. And that would eventually trickle down to just inability to train at the level that he used to. When you have an athlete that has trained their entire life and is really close to success and is training at a high level, when all of a sudden they don't train at that level, that also feeds into depression, lack of motivation, because you've changed their whole world, right? They're not burning what they need to burn. So it feeds into this depression loop, fatigue loop, symptom loop, negativity loop very quickly. Patient also had a lot of chronic cervical spine pain, right? The neck was very sore. So first treatment, what are you going to do? Get them out of pain. And the fastest way I know how to do this is just with that beautiful standard concussion protocol that we have. Patient comes in the room, concussion protocol comes on. I'm also going to be coming in with the precision care after. I think it's important to know when you have a patient that actually had a concussion, especially a sports concussion, especially somebody who's probably had multiple concussions, that when you're running the standard concussion protocol, that you don't just go, oh, slam dunk concussion, I have a concussion protocol, here's the treatment, and then you leave them because 94 and 94 will come on and it is a thing. People genuinely can get super sick and anxious when that frequency comes on if they have a vestibular issue. So I will always stay in the room and monitor the patient. And when 94 and 94 is on, I you're not gonna say, oh no, here it comes. This could make you sick. You're just gonna monitor because the vast majority of cases, 94 and 94 is just fine on people. But I always like to sit there and just make sure that everything is okay. 35 and 102, balancing the energy centers. I, I do this one a lot. This is one I never ever waver from. I've used it since the beginning. I love running it on myself, especially for people who are quite erratic and can be just energetically a lot to, to deal with. So I really like 35 and 102 after the concussion protocol is on because of all the neck pain, 40 and 396 seem like a good idea. And because it's three years chronic, I know there's hardening. I know there's scar tissue in the muscle bellies, the fascia, the nerves through the neck. So those were my really good result frequencies that I used while doing like the supine cervical program that we do. And I'm not afraid of 81 and 49, especially when things are compressed and jammed in the cervical spine. So 81 and 49, increasing the secretions and the vitality to those structures that have especially been stuck and immovable for a little while. So I'm doing that with C-spine treatment, with manual therapy, suboccipital decompression. The patient was asleep three months into the concussion protocol. So like I said, I was in there watching him sleep essentially, and then went in after the concussion protocol was over. So what is it like 36 minutes or so? Then when he's a little bit awake, doing those frequencies that are listed above, supine cervical treatment, And all the range of motion improved in all the ranges. So when he had come in, rotation and side bending were limited. I don't have what the degrees were here, but I could dig that up for somebody who wanted to see that. And painful. So the patient wakes up 100% pain-free and happy. So for somebody who comes in grumpy and depressed, when they get up off the table and they're looking at you and they're like, that was great feels so good. I'm like, wonderful. Like that is something to note. They feel happy, right? That's that don't feel afraid to just work with numbers and objective measures. Happy is a good thing. Joy is a good thing. So treatment two, 
same thing. I'm running standard concussion protocol. I ran a little bit of the constitutional factors. They're, those are also very grounding frequencies. I feel like we don't talk about those very often. Increase the vitality. So 49 and 39, I believe is for male vitality because he had dealt with lack of motivation and everything was just hard. And there was a lot of lack in his life. Balancing the energy centers, 40 and 396 again for nerve pain, running, hardening and scarring in those vessels. Again, not super complicated. Increasing the secretions with the manual therapy, mobilization with the C-spine, passive range of motion with his neck. All that feels great. Outcomes, the patient was 100% asymptomatic. So zero pain for four days following the first treatment. So that was huge. So like I said, after that first treatment, he wakes up happy. He has no pain that lasted for four days. And that was not taking a custom care home. That was just from that one treatment. I had told him, let's see how long this lasts. When you start to feel something, let me know. And then you come back in. Don't let it creep back up to where it used to be. Let me know if you are a zero out of pain right now, tell me when you're a two and we'll get you back in. The patient was sleeping. So no more insomnia felt like he had deep restful sleep, felt happy and positive. And yes, great. Objective measures, all the C-spine range of motion was still symmetrical and painless. But again, what was the take-home message? Sleep, right? When you are not sleeping, you are not recovering. So going back to a couple podcasts ago, when Carol and I were talking about the differences between how we structured the sports course, so we have rehab, and then we have recovery, and then we have performance enhancement. I do the rehab in the clinic, but then I view the recovery is what's happening at home. So this patient is able to sleep at home. That's aiding the recovery process at the same time, if that makes sense. The insomnia was gone. The patient is sleeping. When the patient is sleeping, we're getting deep restorative repair happening in the soft tissue, which trickles into the next day when things are still symmetrical and pain-free. So those are important measures. So if you're not, if you're a practitioner listening to this, make sure you're not just asking about pain and range of motion. Ask for other things like, how are you sleeping? I, I sleep great. No. What time do you go to bed at? Nine. What time do you fall asleep at? 12. Wrong. That's the bad answer. Like if you're lying in bed for three hours playing video games, that's not going to bed at nine. On the flip side, if you're asking them, oh, I go to bed at nine and I pass out right away. Falling asleep too quickly isn't always a great thing either. That means you're overtired, right? So there's that sweet spot, I believe, and I know it changes, but I believe it's three to seven minutes is all we want by the time we get into bed and decide to sleep, to sleep. So talking about sleep, how you're falling asleep, are you staying asleep? Great that you're falling asleep, but if you're getting up at two in the morning and again, you're wired for sound and want to go jogging, that's not wonderful either. And then again, following up with how do you feel when you wake up? Because so many times we'll see patients that go to bed early enough. They are asleep for the whole night and their aura ring tells them that they're sleeping for the whole night, but they wake up and they feel terrible, right? So if you're not waking up feeling refreshed and restored, that's also an issue. So ask those really good questions to your patients about the quality of their sleep. All right, standard cushion protocol again, constitutional factors, vitality, balancing the energy centers, working with the tissue that's hard and scarred after all those years of not moving. So the same things that we did before. Again, the patient is asymptomatic. Um, this is more like a maintenance treatment at this point. The range of motion in his neck are all symmetrical. Patient says, I am sleeping better than I ever have in my entire life. Wonderful. That is better than increased range of motion, in my opinion. Training intensity is starting to increase. And as that intensity is starting to increase, the patient is still reporting that everything feels great. So this is a patient that will come in because he's an athlete for continued care. So 
sometimes we talk about, is it a one and done or like when are patients done? Some patients are never going to be done with treatment because they're always tearing and breaking things. So for athletes, regardless if they're weekend warriors or professional athletes, there's always going to be some maintenance. So whether it's coming in once a month, every six weeks, every eight weeks, I think there's always a case for coming back in for treatment. This patient decided I'm just going to buy a custom care because I never not want to sleep and I never want to be in that position ever again. And I'm never going to stop training. So he bought a custom care. He can treat himself. And his little testimonial was FSM has helped my headache severity and frequency go way down. I tried a lot of therapy after my concussion, but I found to get me up the hill and into recovery for the long term was FSM. So I felt that was a very nice little testimonial. I see there's something in the Q&A here. This was when we didn't have concussion in Vegas. It was just a concussion protocol. So this was before Vegas really was in the limelight. If I could go back in time, I definitely hit that Vegas nerve. But back then, we didn't really talk about the Vegas nerve. Thank you. Oh, so please explain the constitutional a little more. So the constitutional factors are the irregular verbs. So 6.8 is really nothing on A and 38 on B is really nothing on B. But together, they, um, and I know like naturopaths and people who work with homeopathies could probably explain the constitutional factors a little bit better. It was explained to me the best way is it is a very grounding kind of systemic energy frequency. So when people are super floaty and even if they're anxious, I will run those constitutional factors. I'll tell them to hold a washcloth in each hand, have them sit up. And it's a very grounding frequency. And there's a lot of more constitutional factors. They fall into little categories. And Carol talks about that in the advance. So maybe we could have her follow up on this question next week a little bit better than I could. I am going to advance the slide if my computer will call operate. And I just have one more thing here. So one of the biggest adjuncts that we do in the sports course that is not in the core is new motor patterning. And as a trainer, that's what I was before I got into all this movement and getting people to move efficiently and effectively is always my, it's my passion. And it is what I want people to do. So getting them to move better on their own, whether it's going for a walk or throwing a baseball is improved with FSM in ways I never thought imaginable. So this case study is tying everything together as far as what we do in rehab, what we do in recovery, and what we do in sports performance for the sports course. This was an Olympic speed skater I worked with. So his history was, it was an old fracture that he had in his fibula that was still causing him pain, restrictions, and weakness after, I think, five years. He also had a lot of lumbopelvic um, compression and tightness, and his hip flexors were chronically tight. Of course, they were chronically tight because he's a speed skater. So people who are flexed over in skating are going to have chronically tight hip flexors. So this is not rocket science, but worth still worth noting. Treatment overview here. What do we want to do? We want to properly identify the cause of his low back pain. So I always look at the pelvis and when I look at the pelvis, I look at the sacrum to see if there's a torsion, right? If that sacrum is not sitting in the ilia properly, if it's moving on a different angle, I want to check the dura. I want to check a lot of things that other people don't get to look at and see. When I'm working with a professional or an Olympic athlete, it goes without saying they have seen the best of the best. So when I come in, I want to offer something that maybe they haven't ever seen before. So whether that comes from a little bit of a different assessment skill and definitely a bit of a different treatment set using FSM. So these are the places that I like to go. I want to treat the old fracture. Why? Because we can. Where else besides FSM would you even think about treating a fracture that had already healed? You would just think, 
he had a fracture, let's heal. So that's done. No, we still might be able to do some work with that old fracture. And then yes, of course we have to release those hip flexors, but blah, blah, blah. The main thing is there must be some compensatory movement, right? The fibular fracture caused pain, torn and broken, but because he's an Olympic athlete, he does what we say is he blows through the stop signs, right? Professional athletes, elite athletes, even certain weekend warriors, if they're wired a certain way, are not going to take time off. They're not going to rest. They're going to play through pain. They're going to walk through pain. And a lot of times their pain markers or pain threshold is completely different than a lot of other people. They get what's called they get different motor patterns, right? So the muscles that should have been stabilizers end up being primary movers and so on and so forth. And when you get these dysfunctional motor patterns happening, when the tissue heals, that motor pattern doesn't always get the memo that they can go back to their original jobs. And that's why you get compensatory injuries like those tight hip flexors. What we determined pretty quickly on is, yes, his left hip flexor was chronically shortened because when you are speed skating, you are going around a track and you're skating in one direction. And yes, they train in both directions, but they are always racing a certain way. So his left was a little bit shortened just due to the mechanics of his sport. So we treated psoas, QL, multifidi, the erectors, the dura, all with our amazing frequencies like 91, 13, 51. So hardening, scarring, sclerosis in the fascia, the muscle belly, the connective tissue, the adipose, the hip capsule. I have an innate love affair with 480 in the hip. The hip capsule is just something that when you're treating something very deep, 480 just melts everything. So I love 480, especially with hip stuff. I also was working with the dura. So we're doing neck and thoracic flexion. So like I said, he had back pain. So we have contacts at the suboccipits. We have contacts at the sacrum and I'm just having him flex and extend. And he's all oh, that feels so good. So you can do that in a seated position actively. And you can also have the patient supine. So same thing, contacts are at the neck, contacts are at the sacrum. And just having them like flex their pelvis or flex their knees. So they're increasing lumbar flexion can be very nice for treating the dura in that way. We're running the concussion protocol because he's an athlete and he needs it. And then those new movement protocols. So I am using the, I'm going to do, a, we spend a whole day doing this in the sports course, but very basically what we are doing is wiping an old movement pattern and then loading a good one. So we're using 40 on A, quiet the activity of the cerebellum and the sensory and the motor cortex. So we're going to be having the athlete do the most obvious compensated movement pattern. So maybe that would be a squat. Maybe that is in a shoulder scenario, maybe just doing an upper extremity test to see how the scapulothoracic function is. So how the scapulas are articulating and we're not going to give them any sort of cues or feedback. We're just watching the dysfunction take place and we're using 40 and 84 and 40 and 92 just wipe that memory. We have to remind the central nervous system. Remember how you did this? This is pretty bad. You shouldn't be doing it like that. And then we're going to come in and do 81. We're going to increase the secretions or help the activity of the sensory motor cortex, the cerebellum, and maybe the peripheral nerve needs a little bit of help. And then we're going to do all the corrections. So then we can help them I want you to fire this muscle. I want you to bring your foot forward. I want you to externally rotate. And so this is why it takes a whole day in the sports course, because I walk you through how to make those corrections and how to get somebody to fire a muscle that hasn't been firing for potentially years. So it's so cool to watch. This, this is my favorite thing by far to treat and by far to teach. So the next treatments, again, we are dealing with the old fracture at the fibula, which was, was still causing, because of that compensatory movement pattern, a lot of splinting in the anterior and posterior lower leg musculature. That's what it stands for, musculature. 
So we're going to treat scarring in the periosteum and in the bone. We're going to be doing 124 in the periosteum and the bone because things don't get scarred from outer place. There was an original torn and broken in the bone that caused everything else to happen. So that's when we have to go back and treat how did this happen? What was broken? And then we're going to go do that new movement formula or that reboot pattern with walking, squatting. I'm going to get him to mimic an app, like a stride that he would do on the ice so we can dial it in really specific to his activity. And then I'm going to send him home with the custom care because I want all that recovery stuff to happen at night. So he's going to get concussion. He's going to get maybe like the myofascial trigger point protocol. This again was a little bit before I was customizing everything. He loved relax and balance because he's anxious just like everybody else to get back out there. So subsequent treatments, we're not having any pain in the bone anymore, but he's finding that his lumbar, lumbar spine now feels compressed. Okay. So again, it's not always going to follow this beautiful pattern of pain-free, 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 right? Someone's going to come in that feels great, but now I feel this. And that was this case of my legs feel great, but now my low back feels really compressed right now. Of course it is because we're changing all the patterning, right? So maybe we're getting muscles firing in a different way. And so the compression is just because he's actually an extension for the first time and those facet joints need to get on board. We did still find that sacral torsion was there. So I treated that and that's a whole other podcast, but getting the sacrum to flex and extend on a horizontal axis, as opposed to being hung up on an oblique axis using 40 and 124. So inflammation and torn and broken in the periosteum can be very beneficial for those like facet syndrome people. So when people feel compressed, a lot of times it's just because things are compressed. Things are articulating in a way that maybe feels more like bone on bone, or it just feels jammy. What else will people say? Pinched, compressed. So you'll hear these words and 124 and 40 can be very helpful in the periosteum, right? And periosteum is innervated felt around the bone. So when people are having pain, when it hurts coming into extension, this is exactly where I'll start to get the pain to come down. Treat the dura, continuing with the custom care with the late onset muscle soreness, relax and balance, facet acute protocols. The next treatment, again, we're, we want to make sure everything that we're doing clinically is symmetrical and preserved. We're going to add him another dura treatment, post osteopathic manual therapy treatment. We're doing new movement protocols with spine flexion. So we want to make sure that the compression that he had in his low back doesn't come back. We want to make sure that those facet joints are stacking properly. So we're doing new movement with spine flexion and then we're going to do spine flexion and then we're going to start mimicking strides. So he's a speed skater. We want him back to activity as perfectly as possible. And then again, he's got the custom care at night. We want to make sure he's sleeping and we're trying to get him to the Sochi Olympics. And his testimonial was Kim's professional care, skillful treatments helped me recover from an ailing injury that multiple treatments from traditional massage and physiotherapy couldn't figure out right away. I still regard Kim's FSM treatments as the key reason why I was able to regain full strength after my injuries and make it to Sochi. And he meddled twice. Again, the take home here, I think, is regain full strength after my injuries. So sometimes we, as practitioners, get only so far and we think, okay, his pain is down and his range of motion is okay. But getting the strength back and the strength balanced, I think is something we all need to look at as practitioners, regardless of the patient that we're treating, whether it's an athlete or not. I'm going to take a quick peek at the Q and a no 89. I don't know what that would be for like 40 and 89 wasn't really a thing that we did that much of back then I could have would have probably thrown 40 and 89 in 
now. And I typically do that with athletes just to make sure. But a lot of times athletes aren't afraid of moving anything, regardless of how long they've had it, even though I'll still run it just to make sure that they're not afraid to move it. Typically they're blowing through the stop signs. Like there is no fear, like this is fine and rip, but you probably would use 40 and 89. I think that's probably what, what that comment was and best towel position for different injuries. Yeah. So that's a loaded question. Again, that's why the sports course is as long as it is because sometimes there is a case for starting something at the spine and following the nerve to the extremity. Sometimes there's a case for sandwiching the area and doing manual therapy in between the towels. So it really depends on the case. A lot of times we were doing like sandwiching the area. So if we're doing hip flexors, one towel on the hip flexor, one towel maybe under the glute and working in between that. So we're trying to shorten up the distance where those contacts are. So the frequency can be like concentrated in that area. New movement protocols are giving me such success in my clinic since doing the sports course in Arizona. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Like it was such a big, like, but there's a reason why I use game changers as my like tagline, because it really was what helped me close the case. Cause you do get such great success with so many frequencies, like scarring and inflammation, right? Like those are two slam dunks that, you know, you can get success with, but it's when they're coming back a few days later and saying, Oh, it came back. This is what the catalyst was. Why those ones changed for me anyways. I think that's about it as far as what I had on my PowerPoint here. So I'll stop sharing that with everybody. I hope that was helpful. Instead of just talking, I like to have like little cases because I think the stories I know for myself, when I go to the core and I hear Carol's stories, those are what help me think about what to do with other patients. Hopefully those little nuggets were helpful. Q&A. Wonderful and helpful. Thanks, Alf. I always love your positive feedback. I don't know if there's any other questions. Otherwise, great nuggets. Thanks. You can come hang out with us in Portland next weekend. There's still, we'll make space for people who want to come. Aside from the Portland sports course, we're going to have the one in Hawaii. So two great opportunities still this year to come live. I don't do the sports course via video anymore because it's just too hard as like a manual therapist and exercise therapist. I think there's just such valuable information that you learn doing, seeing, touching and experiencing that you don't get just watching me do it on a video. Nuggets, nuggets. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else that I'm missing? Great. Thanks for all the feedback, everybody. I appreciate it. Yeah. You can still keep sending your questions via email. We, Carol and I get them. We'll we'll talk about them next weekend. And I think that's about it. Yeah. If you can't, if you can't make it to to Portland, plan a vacation in Hawaii and then come out and learn. Yes. And then just (laughs) hang out sports and take a vacation at the same time. (laughs) Yes, that's exactly it. I know I'm so excited about Hawaii even. It just can't come soon enough. Yeah, everybody come sign up, send your questions, keep coming. And what's your website address again, Kim? It's fsmsports365.com. fsmsports365.com. Oh, and I do have a quote. Oh, cool. Hang on. And I thought this one was great. So it's about gratitude. Gratitude will shift you to a higher frequency And you will attract much better things. And I thought that was just very, I'm trying to be on this big gratitude. So when I went off of social media, I went into this like gratitude instead of waking up in the morning and checking my phone first thing and checking my Instagram and checking my emails. The first things I was thinking of, what are three things I am grateful to start my day with? And then I was going to bed journaling. What were the five things that I was grateful for at night. So going to bed with gratitude, waking up with gratitude, just feeling happier in general. I used to carry a little rock in my pocket that said grateful. Yes. And then you grab it. Just Um, just to remind you. Yes. I like that. I want a rock with grateful on there. (laughs) All right. That's it. everybody. Yeah. And we're ending on time. Look at that. That's right. You thought it was going to be short. (laughs) 
I forget how much I talk about things. It looks like everybody loved it. I appreciate it. I mean, you so much. Yes, I'm glad it worked out, and we'll see Carol next week. And okay. she'll be back next week, and we'll be back to the, the old stuff. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody. All right, thanks, everybody. See you next week. Next week. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.